On this edition of Geopolitics and Empire, we interview author Patrick Wood. He's written numerous books, some on the Trilateral Commission and others on technocracy, and he has worked with the late Professor Anthony Sutton. His website is technocracy.news, and today we'll be discussing the global trend toward technocracy, what is technocracy, uh, as well as the technocratic uh, global governance. And it's a great pleasure to have you on, Patrick. I'm excited to be with you today. This is uh, this is great doing such a long distance broadcast. We couldn't do this 10 years ago, you realize that. But today, the world is getting smaller. I guess we can think uh, think uh, technocracy, <laughs> or we'll, uh, we'll, well, get, we'll get in, just we'll get into just that. technology, not technocracy. <laughs> okay. So to start off, you know, I would venture to say that. You know, most people have not heard of the term technocracy. Uh, right. It was a movement that began in the 1930s. Um, from my way of looking at it, I, I can't seem to define it any other way than the form of scientific dictatorship, because it's it it forms the essence of you know all of that dystopian science fiction, uh, such as Yevgeny Zamyatin's We, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, George Orwell's 1984. So could you for for us break down what is technocracy? Well, technocracy was started in the 1930s in America, at Columbia University. And <clears throat> uh, this was during the Great Depression, uh, where it looked like to many people that capitalism was dead. There was, um, well, the depression was global, not just the United States, but it, it hit us particularly hard and there was lots of unemployment, there was food lines, uh, there was <clears throat> you know, bad attitude everywhere, basically. The scientists at Columbia University and engineers, mostly, not all, but mostly, decided that they were going to create a brand new economic system that had never been tried before. It was a, to be a, a resource-based economic system. And it was predicated on, uh, enabled, uh, rather, on social engineering or by social engineering. This is a concept that was being played with back then. There was lots of, um, oh, developmental uh, psychologists and stuff that were working with conditioning of animals, for instance. And these scientists and engineers figured, well, hey, society is full of animals. <laughs> and, I, you know, basically, the people and they can be conditioned and manipulated just like animals can. Um, they had a very dim view, by the way, of humanity, that, uh, that you know, humans were just basically uh, collections of atoms and molecules, and they weren't really, um, uh, you know, particularly special on the planet. So they took it upon themselves to create this economic system, and it was, it was based on social engineering, being able to condition people to do what they wanted them to do. And they thought that this would result in utopia. There was a book written in 1932, the same year that Columbia housed the technocracy study group, um, written by a Brit by the name of Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. The term Brave New World is now part of our English vernacular. Whenever something scary or creepy happens with one of the big tech companies or whatever, you know, people, oh, it's a brave new world. <laughs> We're living in a brave new world. They don't realize that Aldous Huxley was looking at technocracy when he was inspired to write this book. And if anybody's read the book, Brave New World, they will instantly identify it with scientific dictatorship. This is where it was leading. And... That's pretty disturbing in a way, but you know, you look back across history, you see what was said about it back then, you see how it was rejected in America uh, categorically by the end of the 1940s, um, and you look forward to what's going on today and you realize what they said was coming has actually come. They look forward in time back then to now, but they saw pretty clearly a lot of them that uh, that it would result in scientific dictatorship. This, this is basically what we're struggling with in the world today. And I probably should say right now at the start, 
if there's engineers and scientists listening, <laughs> as there probably will be, I am not anti-scientist and I'm not anti-engineer and I'm not specifically anti-technology. I love technology personally. I've spent a career in technology as well. And I have all the gadgets. I love to read science books and stuff to you know see what's going on and the latest stuff. <clears throat> when science serves me, I like it a lot. When technology serves me, like we're using this video conference thing, you know, this is great. We could never do this before. We could send each other a snapshot of a picture to know what we look like, but that's about it. But when technology is used to force me to serve it, that's where I draw the line. If that's where I draw the line with technocracy. So if anybody uh, you know, would want to accuse me of being anti-technology, anti-engineer, anti-whatever, they're absolutely wrong. The issue here is control. Aldous Huxley saw this when he wrote Brave New World. It was an issue of control. Who is going to be in control? The individual or the collective? Yeah, and I, I would add for the longest time, you know, I was against this idea of global government, right, which I think is one aspect of technocracy. And it wasn't until I, I read a definition from G. Edward Griffin, who I, I believe you're friends with, and, and I, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting some years ago and having lunch with him. And he said that it's not good or bad in and of itself. It's kind of like a tool, uh, and it depends on you know, how it's being used or who, who uses it. And I think history shows us that things tend to go uh, in a bad direction. And I wanted to ask you next about uh, communism and Marxism, you know, so you mentioned the 1930s and I suppose the um, technocracy kind of faded away. And then, you know, we had the, the Cold War and this fear of communism spreading this worldwide revolution and Marxism. Uh, and then the first Cold War ended in 1990. Mm. And there, you know, we see cultural Marxism in the U.S. today uh, and, and in Europe. It's becoming popular again. And there's some people screaming, you know, be careful with communism, it's coming back. But you say we shouldn't be, communism isn't the enemy, but rather it's technocracy. So can you talk about mm -hmm. those two? I can. I studied this, I did a lot of original research um, on historic technocracy. And one thing is kind of puzzling in a way, because initially I thought, oh, this is, has something to do with communism. It is collectivist, like communism is collectivist as well, uh, but technocracy was decidedly anti-communist back in the 1930s. And I was shocked to find that out. They, they basically hated each other. It wasn't just a mild disagreement. They hated each other. <clears throat> and if you were to walk up, uh, walk up to a technocrat on the street and, and accuse him of being a communist, you might get in a fist fight. They felt that strongly. And of course, the communists didn't like the criticism, so they didn't like the technocrats. But the issue with communism, first off, that they disagreed with, is that communism was still based on a price-based economic system. It had a currency, it had pricing for goods and services, and the technocrats believed that pricing, a price-based economic system, was evil. And so they rejected communism immediately. They believed that the only way to regulate a resource-based economic system was by measuring energy. That, in other words, the energy it took to produce a product or to, uh, to, you know, to run society at large. And energy is not currency. It's not a, it's not a price-based system. It's an energy-based system. So they actually had designed into their economic system an energy currency, they called it, that was based on ERGS, E-R-G-S. That's a measurement of electricity, of course. It was based on energy, and things were to be priced in terms of the energy that it took to make them. So the shirt that we're wearing, for instance, theoretically, you could 
trace the shirt back to the mill, back to the factory, back to the farm that did it, back to the, the, the ships or the planes or trains or whatever that transported it. And you could calculate all of the energy that went into creating our shirt. That would be the price, according to technocrats. And they believe that this is the way to balance uh, resource availability against consumption. And I would stress again that, that communism was a political system. Marxism was a political system. Technocracy is an economic system. So there was a difference in philosophy there as well. How will you control people? The communists said, we'll control it by, we'll tell them what to do and they better do it or we'll shoot them uh, or punish them in some other way. The technocrats said, we'll manage the whole thing, resources and, 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 and consumption according to our energy algorithm. And we'll simply give everybody in society an allotment of energy credits. They called it energy script. And that would be what they could spend during that period of time, a month, a quarter, whatever. And um, if they ran out, tough. They'd have to wait until the next period of time to get another allocation. And if they had units, uh, uh, energy units left over after the period, if they would expire. So there was no way to um, save anything from period to period. There was no way to save money at all. And they basically completely wrote the idea of private property out of the picture entirely. That had no part in their economic model. So there was lots of differences between communism and, um, and technocracy. If we look at China today, China has been declared to be a technocracy today. Even scholars like Dr. Prakana have said that, but this has been known now for at least, um, I'd say 18 to 20 years, that China has morphed from being a communist dictatorship into being a technocratic dictatorship. And <clears throat> one of the good evidences of this, I know people are going to squawk when they hear me say this, but or having said that, but one of the evidences of this now, if you check the recent news, there is a growing Marxist movement in China today that's being suppressed by the government. They're actually arresting these people for being Marxist and promoting a Marxist ideology. And that is the strangest thing. I saw that even knowing what I know. It's still it's the strangest thing to think that the, <clears throat> that the, the, the biggest perpetrator of communism probably in the world is now anti-Marxist because it conflicts with their tech, tech today. Uh, we see this sweeping the world because they're trying to export their ideology to other parts of the world. And um, if you could just give us a little description, then I'm sure some people have heard about what life uh, in China is like today. Uh, and you talk about it in your book, where they've created this system of gamification. It's kind of funny because uh, I'm a teacher and in some of my classes I've been using gamification, but in, the, in a good way. Uh, but in China, I, I think we mentioned this earlier, you can use things for good or for bad. And in China, they've created the Sesame social credit uh, system. And I've been reading, there's this really popular YouTube channel called ADV China, uh, where you have this, uh, he's one of the first English blog, uh, YouTubers um, who's been in China for a decade. He married a Chinese woman. Um, and they're now saying it's a lot of foreigners are, are getting out of China because it's become it's becoming a very authoritarian, totalitarian, dystopian. You detail in your book how they let a BBC reporter loose uh, in a city of three million people. And using this technological grid, in seven minutes, they were able to physically uh, get him. And you know, if you have a low score now in this system, you can't buy travel tickets, train, plane, you can't get a good job. Uh, so if you could talk about that, and if it's if this you think will spread from out of China to the West, because I think we're seeing some aspects of it in Europe and the EU as well as the US. 
We definitely are. Um, it's, it's interesting how the artificial intelligence community is responding to China today and what's going on in China and the things that you just mentioned. Um, one of the creators of deep learning technology uh, for artificial intelligence, which is a big part of what China is doing right now, uh, based in Canada, uh, which isn't the bastion of freedom, by the way, either, but he's based in Canada. And he has recently thrown up the alarm bell to, uh, you know, complain, if you will, about China's use of deep learning technology that he by and large created or started in the first place. And he's saying that they're using it for the control of man or mankind in their country, basically digital slavery. And this is coming from, you know, one of the creators of artificial intelligence in the first place. It reminds me a little bit kind of of what happened when the atomic bomb was invented originally, that the scientists that were working on the atomic bomb back before war, uh, during World War II were a little bit concerned as they got along that maybe they were creating something that would not be good for humanity. And a lot of them really got concerned. Well, this is what's happening with AI right now. And China is dedicated to being the leader in the world on artificial intelligence. They're using it everywhere in society that they can find a use for it. By 2020, which is only next year now, we say 18 months away from now, China will have installed 600 million cameras in their country to surveil their 1.4 billion citizens. That means for every two, two and a half citizen, there's one camera. All of these cameras are being used for facial recognition and other biometric information, but they're transmitting the live feed now back to computers that are equipped with artificial intelligence algorithms to not only identify the people uh, in, in real time, but to log store and categorize the information to be used against the people um, later on. This is inconceivable, the amount of data that's flowing back to uh, central computers in China. Now, <clears throat> the artificial intelligence designer in Canada that I spoke about, his name is uh, Yeshua Benjo. He noted accurately, very correctly, this makes a lot of sense, that artificial intelligence will not work without data. If you have a program just sitting on a computer and don't have anything, any data to give it, it means nothing. It just sits there. It's like a, a car sitting in the garage. It has no gas. It has no battery. Maybe, you know, just it can't go anywhere. Can't even start it. But when you add gasoline, which is, uh, you know, of course, the, the engine will start up and away you go. Artificial intelligence is like that, and the data is what makes it work. The more data, the more possibility you have for, for applying deep learning algorithms to make sense out of it. This is what China is doing. So they have data, the likes of which the world has never, ever seen before, and they're collecting data from from everywhere, all financial transactions, real time now. Um, all uh, police interaction, like uh, if you jaywalked or you committed a crime or you didn't pay a debt, whatever, all banking information, all social media information is being collected real time off, the, uh, off of their equivalent of the Facebook and Twitters. They're rolling that all into a, <clears throat> a master database again, being analyzed by deep learning software. And they're applying what they call a social credit scoring system to every one of their citizens in the country. That means 
if you go down, if you have a, a low score, if you're a troublemaker or a smart aleck, um, like maybe, uh, you know, you, you accumulate points on this scoring system. Let's say, for instance, you've been, <clears throat> you've been uh, uh, spotted as jaywalking, say, four or five times in the last month, and you smoke, and you missed a payment on your car or something like that, or you wrote a bad post critical of the government or the chairman, then your score would be dropped like a rock. And you, if you went down to a train station to buy a ticket to go see your family in another province, they would simply say, I'm sorry, sir, but you're unable to buy a ticket because your social score is so low. That means that all of the points of purchasing things are tied into this same master system that the government's created. And if you don't score correctly, you're denied the privilege of buying a plane ticket or a train ticket or going to a certain university or um, living in a certain nicer apartment, perhaps, or nicer housing. This is absolutely dictatorial. It's social engineering, for sure. Uh, it's a, uh, it puts a, a, a digital manacle around your neck to where actually people in China, and this has been for people that have come out and reported on this, the people in China that are subject to this now say, yes, <clears throat> it has changed our behavior because now that we understand the system, we're figuring out ways to hide from it, if you will, you know, like to, to avoid it or to avoid getting nailed for something. So somebody may think something in their heart or in their head but they don't dare express that anywhere now in public because they'll get nailed and they'll lose all their privileges. This is absolutely horrendous to humanity. This technology and mass now that China has, they are exporting it to any country who will purchase it from them and accept it. Now, most of these countries that they're selling to are not Western democracies. They're more like the dictatorial autocratic countries around the world. But China is seeking to create a global technocracy that will mimic what they're doing right now within their own borders. This is totally disturbing to me, and it should be to anybody that listens to this, to this video that, uh, well, you say, why is it significant? Well, when, when you're dealing with 1.4 billion people out of, what, seven and a quarter billion people in the world, you better pay attention. It's a lot of people. The same thing is happening in India, right, by the way. Uh, India is rolling into a technocracy very quickly. Europe has already shown, you know, people are talking about Europe in terms of technocrats and technocracy already. Um, so a large part of the world really is kind of rolling into technocracy already. It should concern us because I don't think the rest of the world is going to really enjoy the Chinese experience right now. And I just wanted to point out something I read recently that, again, nobody commented much on. Um, apparently, there's a Democratic candidate for presidency in the U.S. Uh, in 2020 it seems he is of Chinese ethnic origin. Origin. Uh, his name is Andrew Yang, and part of his platform, he has proposed digital social credits uh, to be used um, in the U.S. So I, I kind of find I, I, you've probably read that, and that's just kind of that's one example of where it's being exported. <laughs> but it's just still kind of unbelievable that you know what happened in the U.S. You're right. But remember that a lot of this technology was invented in the United States in the first place. And not to say that there are, not, there are a lot of bright people, very bright people in China, but a lot of the technology that they started with was, was from here. And some of the companies that invented this stuff, realizing it was what they were doing was illegal in America, they willingly went to China to which would accept their their technology 
<clears throat> and they developed the technology and perfected it in China. And now they're re-importing it back into the United States. Uh, that's not totally surprising. This has happened in other industries as well over the decades. Um, but you also need to remember that that China came in came back into the global economic system uh, in the early to mid 1970s, and in particular, it was a big Nick Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger who engineered or architected that reintroduction of China to the global system. Uh, in fact, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was a co-founder of the Trilateral Commission in 1973 with David Rockefeller, Brzezinski really is credited as being the, the single-handed hero, uh, they call him at least, uh, of bringing China out of, the, out of the, the darkness back into the world system. When they did that, they poured money into China like there was no tomorrow. Companies connected to the Trilateral Commission, like Bechtel Engineering and, and other infrastructure companies, uh, developed the infrastructure in China to do what they do today. The technology companies stampeded to China to find cheap labor, as did factories. Uh, we lost, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of little factories and stuff in America since the early 1970s, but uh, you know, this is what happened, and this was architected by this economic policy that the Trilateral Commission had back then, um, and we're suffering the results of this now in America, I might add. But, but here's the thing. The Trilateral Commission said in their early documents they're going to create a new international economic order. It was all over their literature. Sutton and I wrote about it. Um, we did not understand what the new international economic order was, and I honestly didn't understand it until I discovered historic technocracy. But when Brzezinski wrote his book that kind of got him interested, or David Rockefeller looking at him, the book was titled um, uh, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. And it was Between Two Ages, excuse me, was the main title. The subtitle was America, or, uh, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. <clears throat> Brzezinski was writing, in hindsight now, about technocracy, the technocronic era, using technology to run society. And <clears throat> it wasn't a political system, it was an economic system. Um, but they pledged to create a new international economic order back then, and they fed their doctrine to the United Nations uh, in the mid-1980s, the United Nations rebranded it, called it sustainable development. Same thing, technocracy from the 1930s. So <clears throat> this is where all this stuff came from. And the technology that built China was Western technology. That's my point. It was Western technology. And those people did not invest money in China to not get a payback. They did it for investment. They want results. They want profits. They want influence. So we can look at China from a distance and say, oh, those bad, bad Chinese people, you know, their, their country is doing horrible things and whatever. But you have to remember, well, at least speaking from America, can't speak for you, but speaking here for America, Americans need to remember that big tech's tentacles and industrial tentacles are deeply, deeply embedded in China. And China could not and would not exist without those associations with the West. So it's not just China, is it? <laughs> it's like, it's well, us and, too. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned uh, the UN officials and you know, we have this situation going on with uh, Venezuela, where the U.S. is attempting a, re a regime change there. And I was listening to a U.N. official uh, comment on this situation, who, who I actually know and who I'll be interviewing um, soon, hopefully, 
And he was the uh, reporter who went to Venezuela last year to do a, the fact-finding mission. And he made an interesting comment uh, when he was discussing what should happen in Venezuela as a solution. And he said, um, in Venezuela, there are too many ideologues, right? Like Marxist uh, ideologues and not enough technocrats. So it was interesting that <laughs> that term came up. And he, he's coming from the UN and it seems like a lot of these people in, in these institutions, you know, you mentioned Paracana, UN, UN uh, institutions have this faith uh, in technocracy that it will solve uh, problems. But, you know, we have so many problems with government at a local level where it's dysfunctional at a national level uh, and just imagining it at an at a international level. What it seems there's this utopian vision of technocracy, but what's to say that absolute power wouldn't corrupt absolutely? Uh, you know, what failsafe is there if someone decides to, you know, create a dictatorship? <clears throat> Why do they have so much faith in it? Well, that's a deep question. Um, I, I think maybe I would kind of elevate our horizon here back to the United Nations just for a second um, and point out that <clears throat> the UN has been very outspoken about sustainable development. That doctrine originally came from members of the Trilateral Commission, um, <clears throat> in particular from a book that was written called Our Common Future back in 1987. Uh, the the author of this or the study team leader of that book was Gru Harlem Brundtland, uh, who was a member of the Trilateral Commission, formerly the Prime Minister of uh, of Denmark. I believe she was the Environmental Minister before that, and she was a member of the Trilateral Commission and wrote the book that popularized sustainable development. The United Nations later praised her uh, after the creation of Agenda 21 in 1992 at the first Earth Summit that took place in Rio de Janeiro. Um, but fast forward to about two and a half years ago, <clears throat> just uh, after the, um, the Paris Climate Summit that the United Nations pulled off. The head of climate change at that time for the UN was Christiana Figueres. Uh, she had a very long title, I won't repeat it, but she was the one that drove the Paris conference and she was the head person in charge of climate change at the United Nations. In the European press conference, <clears throat> she said, and even though the video has been taken down since, I, I watched her lips move <laughs> when, she, when she spoke these words and they have been recorded in blogs and uh, even on the UN's website as well. She said, this is what she said, this is the first time in the history of mankind that we're setting ourselves the task of intentionally within a defined period of time to change the economic development model that has been reigning for at least 150 years since the Industrial Revolution. This has been the intent of the United Nations since at least 1974, one year after the Trilateral Commission was formed, when they passed a resolution, I think maybe it was resolution 1302, it might be different, but it was in 1974, calling for the creation of a new international economic order. That's incredible, 1974. They've been marching to this drumbeat ever since. These people hate capitalism, they hate free enterprise, and they want to replace it with a resource-based economic system, which they now call sustainable development. I make a case in my book that sustainable development is in fact technocracy. I think it's a pretty strong case. But the United Nations has this larger plan to dump capitalism altogether and replace it with this resource-based economic system that is being sold to the world on the basis of utopia. The sustainable development goals start out with 
ending poverty everywhere, uh, providing ho adequate housing for everybody everywhere, providing lifelong learning opportunities for everybody everywhere. Utopia at the United Nations is the big selling point. But if you look down, if you dig down into the fine print, you find out all you have to do to get it is to give up control over all the resources of the world and be willing to accept their dictates as to what you are allowed to consume. In other words, this is not about, they're not about a global dictator. They're about a global economic system that is managed from top to bottom, inputs and outputs, manufacturing and consumption by them, taking all control out of the hands of people. This is a dictatorship. And the United Nations, which we start out talking about this, the United Nations has been throwing out little barbs, if you will, along the way, like the statement by Christiana Figueres, um, <clears throat> that are easily discoverable if you're looking for them. But by and large, you never see this in a headline anywhere. It's not going to be in, in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal. Oh, United Nations wants to, you know, destroy capitalism. They're not going to say that. But that's exactly what they're trying to do. And sustainable development is the vehicle they're doing it. Now, within that, you see periodic statements coming out of the United Nations that talk about technocrats. They use that term internally. It means somebody who is a fixer, who can make things happen using some type of uh, maybe it's a scientific solution. Scientific solution might be monetary, it might be economic, it might be st statistics, it might be physics, might be biology, who knows? But you see the word technocrat being elevated all over the world. I see it now in the European press every week. Somebody's called a technocrat. Um, when Italy almost fell apart in 2010, um, their economic system was just about collapsed completely. Uh, the, you know, the EU sent in uh, a couple of people to take over the country, not elected, but to take over the country to restore the economic system. They called them technocrats. In fact, everybody did. So people are talking more about technocrats, not fully re realizing that the doctrine behind it, the technocrats serve technocracy. And that that has to be attached in every instance of the word technocrat, regardless of where it's applied. And you see it popping up all over the planet, like in Venezuela. They're using it in Argentina. In fact, South American press talks about technocrats frequently. So does uh, Chile. So does Peru. Um, if you're not sensitive to the word, you just don't even think about it, but I am sensitive to it. So I watch, I, I pick up on that kind of stuff pretty quickly. Um, technocrats are fixers. That's how they sell themselves. And um, what's your problem? Call a technocrat. They're not elected. They're appointed by who I don't know, but they're appointed. Uh, they're designed to come in and simply fix the problem and to heck with the people. Just just do something to make it happen. And um, along that line, if we could discuss as well the philosophical, uh, ideological, and, and spiritual aspect, I guess. Um, and I, I would think that people perhaps that are more religious or have a faith might view technocracy as uh, they'll be skeptical, you know, because they'll, they'll think... Uh, Man is evil by nature, uh, and so this kind of thing would end in a dystopia. Uh, and then people who are non-religious, uh, sec secular, um, will have the, a utopian view of, of technocracy. Um, 
and indeed, uh, and you know, as well, people who are who maybe are more uh, religious or th- or non-religious, but think that man is evil by nature, would prefer a smaller state like uh, the U.S. Republic, right, uh, in the beginning. And then people who think man is good by nature wouldn't mind a larger state that takes care uh, of things. And I, I did find an article uh, that mentioned you, and it was from a secular left-wing publication that said exposure to the term technocrat usually comes from propagandists such as you know Patrick Wood, who indict technocrats as leaders in globalist plots to control the masses. Um, it also goes on to say it is an unlikely that a person. So this article confirmed my previous thought, which I formed before I found the article. It said unlikely that a person is a conservative and a technocrat, that the religious, fiscal and anti-bureaucratic nature of uh, Republicans puts them at odds with policy wonks. Technocracy lives on the left. Um, so what what might you say, perhaps comments uh, to your critics as well as this? kind of philosophical divide. Technocracy lives everywhere, on the left and the right, in in different functions, but it lives at both sides. Ever since I started writing about the Trilateral Commission back in uh, the 1970s with uh, Professor Sutton, uh, the global elite didn't know what to do with us exactly. They actually, in the end, they did. They they banned our book from uh, from the largest book chain in the in the country. But <clears throat> they would they would sweep us either to the far left or the far right. They'd either call us, uh, you know, names that would put us to the far right political spectrum, and then on other cases they'd call it turn around and they say we're part of the far left. <clears throat> but it didn't matter to them. Their strategy was to always position themselves as being the moderate middle. They were the reasonable ones. <laughs> they were the sane ones. They were the balanced ones. And the rest of us were simply unbalanced and, you know, maybe mentally deranged or whatever. So criticism that I've received recently is of the same nature. I had people criticize me from the right and people criticize me from the left. It only proves the point that neither one of them, well, maybe they do know what they're talking about, but neither one of them is willing to face the discussion squarely and debate it. They have to result to ad hominem attacks, to throw out the research, to throw out the facts and, uh, you know, the the antithesis, if you will, of their positions. They just simply don't want to talk about it. So this is what happens. Uh, as to the religious side of, uh, of the argument of technocracy, there's quite a bit of debate amongst spiritual circles around the world about technocracy. <clears throat> when I say spiritual, I'll include in that the, you know, the, the, the Christian world as well. But um, you see... Eastern religions talking a lot now are having a lot to do with technocracy and technocratic thinking. You have a lot of big tech companies in Silicon Valley, for instance, attending the Burning Man Festival uh, up in Nevada. It's a, an, an incredible paganistic type of a, a festival where 75,000 people descend on the desert. They build a city in a week. They live there for a week and nothing is left when they're gone. And uh, uh, they're pretty much dedicated to various Eastern types of mysticism and so on. Um, They're obviously in favor. On the Christian side of things that where people might maintain a biblical worldview, um, maybe have some interest in Bible prophecy. Uh, Many Christians don't, of course, today, but uh, but some do. Um, I find a statement by... Uh, Parag Khanna, that was particularly insightful, at least it was to me. Uh, This was from his book, Connectography, which uh, basically talked about connecting the world cities into a a network of global cities uh, for the sake of uh, trade, commerce. This is part of the technocratic doctrine, if you will, to create a global economic system. And he sees it 
being possible by connecting cities together, the global cities together. Um, but he wrote in his book this, this is a direct quote. He says, we are building the global society without a global leader. Global order is no longer something that can be dictated or controlled from the top down. He's right on that. And then he concludes, globalization itself is the order. That's profound in my mind. Globalization is itself the order. They are not seeking to install a global dictator at all. They're trying, they're trying to achieve an economic system that will run itself. I would suggest looking at China that how it will run itself is by artificial intelligence and by algorithms. They'll be set into policies and they'll be turned loose on society to manage society without a global dictator. Now, from a biblical point of view, many Christians who study Bible prophecy would immediately be drawn to Revelation chapter 13, where it talks about buying and selling, uh, or the inability to buy and sell if you refuse to worship the so-called Antichrist. <clears throat> but uh, those Christians also would point out that there will be a global leader one day who will take over the global system and run it for his own nefarious purposes. That is, person is usually referred to as the Antichrist. Um, this is a global dictator, if you will, that Christians are sensitive to. And if they were to understand technocracy and things like what Prague Khanna just said, they might start connecting some dots, thinking maybe, maybe this is the eco maybe this is the system that's being built to one day be headed up by an appointed person, if you will, a master technocrat or a supreme technocrat to set the policies for the entire planet. That's a possibility that some Christians are studying today. But I do find it interesting that Prag Khanna has declared very openly and very plainly, and I think he's absolutely right on this too, by the way. I, I thought this before he's, he wrote it, that the system is growing up all by itself. It's growing up to, to be a digital slavery, if you will, not a feudalistic slavery where there was a dictator to say what people could and could not do. This also is one of the greatest dangers of technocracy, I think, because there's no recourse against a technocratic algorithm. In past centuries or past decades, we have defeated communist dictators. We have defeated fascist dictators. Think of Hitler uh, and Mussolini. Uh, we have defeated socialism in a few places. But how do you defeat a technocracy? There's no person. There's no soldiers. It's just there. And if you go to your bank where you want to take some money out on a weekend, and it says, sorry, sir, your limit is $200 or 200 euros or whatever, you can't get any more money. Who do you complain to? Where do you go? Do you write your senator, congressman, or EU representative, say, I can't get my money out of the bank? Well, no, you're flat out of luck. What does a Chinese citizen do when he goes to the train station? They say, you can't buy a, plane, a train ticket. Does he call Chairman Z? Does he, uh, does he <laughs> write a letter to the, uh, to the party? No, He's, he just has to accept it. There's nobody to complain to, and there's nobody to overthrow. What good would an armed rebellion do in China today? What good would it do? Who do you fight? <laughs> it's like, even if you kill <clears throat> all of the leaders of China, the system is still working. It's still out there. How do you kill it? <laughs> the answer is you can't. So anyway, that's 
that's my take on it at this point. It's, it's a different situation than we've ever really had in history. And I think we can see a bit of a uh, the prologue to it, uh, w especially with this online deplatforming, um, where people from both the left uh, and the right who are have different grievances, right, against the system or establishment, where across the board, you know, Twitter, Google, Gmail, the whole Google suites, you know, Microsoft, Facebook, their accounts are just terminated. And even to the point of the payment processing, where they've set up alternative systems, you know, <laughs> like this alternative media, Gab or Minds or whatever, and they're being blocked, and you're being non-persons uh, in a way. And so I think this is, this seems to be, you know, you, we've talked about China, and now you're seeing this happen in the West, a little taste perhaps of, of what's to come. And so we're slowly running out of time. But are, are there any other points uh, that you'd like to make, make perhaps that I haven't asked uh, or that, that's on your mind? Well, I, I think we've covered a lot of really good ground here in a short period of time. Um, people have gotten the gist of it. I would say that if, uh, the reason I've written now two books on technocracy is to give people a resource base to understand what it's all about. Most people really don't want to understand what it's all about. They're just kind of thinking about themselves and they're you know, living paycheck to paycheck. They don't really care. But for those people who want to know what makes the world go round today, um, the only way to really understand it is at least to start out is to read my books on technocracy. That's Technocracy Rising and the New and the Hard Road to World Order. Uh, both are documented pretty well. I made I put an anthology into or a bibliography, rather, excuse me, into the first book, Technocracy Rising, uh, with about 250 entries or so of uh, things that I discovered. If a person wants to do research on technocracy, that's where you start. I do, I've done the work to, you know, at least to put it together. And you don't have to agree with me necessarily on my take on it, but there is the research and there is the footnotes and people can take that as a tool to branch off and go do their own research. I wish people would, honestly. I wish analysts, I wish political scientists, I wish uh, uh, economists would study this and look at it and tell the world, is this feasible or not? I say no, I say it's not feasible. They say it is. I think we need to have the debate. So anyway, that's why I wrote the books and people can follow along on a daily basis on my website, technocracynews.news, where I curate stories from all around the world that have to do with technocracy. And if anybody follows the stories on there for, say, six weeks or so, it'll open their eyes all by itself. <laughs> like, whoa, I never saw those stories before. Well, that's because they're buried or the, uh, or the headlines are always something else in America. It's always about Trump. It's always about something has happened in Washington, D.C. These stories never get any play in the press in America, but uh, they're there. The point is they're there around the world. So awareness is really important. If you're not aware of this and you've never seen it before, you're probably going to think, eh, who cares? <clears throat> but we're talking about it. And we look at people like Dr. Prakana. He's talking about it. In fact, he wrote a book called Technocracy in America. When I saw that, I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Khanna, because you validated everything I'd written up to that point, <laughs> that, that technocracy has its designs on America as well as the rest of the world. So, you know, people need, uh, I think people just need to start opening their mind up a little bit and finding out what's really going on. And I would add, you know, something you mentioned earlier about the ad hominem attacks, you know, on this podcast, I, I try to get people from left, from right uh, on different topics. And sometimes it's hard to get certain people on. I would like to get Paraghana on and get his take. And it's like you're saying to evaluate these these things on a fact basis to, to look at that research you're, you're talking about and let people come to their own uh, conclusions because, you know, I think some of them are, should be obvious. Um, so your your website is technocracy.news. Uh, people can visit that. They can subscribe. 
They can donate to you, I think, there uh, as well. You've got the books on the Trilateral Commission from a few decades ago, which I think <laughs> people should check out, the technocracy books. Uh, any other way people can find you or, or support you? Well, there's a lot of material on YouTube already, interviews that I've done in the past with different people, and if people just search for Patrick Wood on YouTube, they'll find a lot of stuff they could listen to that might help. Um, I, I Unfortunately, there's not one single interview that really explores everything that there is to explore, uh, but it gives you a flavor. It gives you maybe one little angle on some issue, some particular issue or topic. But, uh, you know, like our, this interview today has been very good. We've covered a lot of important territory, but we could probably spend hours, <laughs> you know, kind of exploring all kinds of different things. We really didn't get into fintech. We didn't really get into you know, all the details of surveillance and what's going on with 5G and the Internet of Things and whatever. There's lots of stuff we still could talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just completely forgot about the crypto and the fintech. Oh, well, I guess we'll have to save that for next time. <laughs> for sure. We'll do it. Okay, well, thanks again for your time. My pleasure.